for the last few days of this university. But uh, uh, firstly, I will give you a talk uh, on some interesting issues out of space today and when yesterday we had a very important day, which was Yes, we call it the day of cosmonautics, yeah, and uh, that was the 60th anniversary of the Venus flight into space. And that country is really very proud of that. But firstly, I want to ask you, what is outer space? What is it? How can you translate it? Outer space. Yes, exactly. And how can you define it? What is outer space? Sorry? Well, it is space that starts from the surface of the Earth and extends infinitely. Nobody knows where it is the moment right? So, uh, it goes on and on and down, and our <coughs> tiny planet is lost somewhere in this outer space. Uh, what does it consist of? Uh -huh. Yes, can you? Uh, what does it consist of? It mostly consists of empty space. There is nothing up there. But then why do people explore this space? Why do we need it? <laughs> yep. Ah. I will get you out if you don't work properly. Continue. Yep. Continue. Yes. Uh, have a look. What is that? Oh, it's a galaxy. Uh, what is it called? It's the galaxy that our Earth belongs to. Milky Way. Well, uh, the solar system is only one part of this galaxy. Yes, but uh, we belong to Milky Way, the galaxy that consists of many, many, many universes. Well, the look is fantastic. We look at the night and the sky. Yeah? We can see fantastic sights. We dream about space and we have dreamt about space since our history. Uh, so it's one reason why we explore it. Yeah? We want to make settlements. And this all far off is the planet. What for we don't know, but we want to live there. Yeah? Yes? We dream about our brethren. Habits. Extraterrestrial intelligence. Nizimnoi Yeah? So we want to believe that we are not alone in this. Out of space. We want to find friends. Well, mostly friends, not enemies, but we don't know what we will find. Yes, those were dreams, but nowadays uh, space uh, has another very important function in our lives. Well, without space, without those many, many, many satellites, our communication will be impossible. So, our smartphones, our uh, you know, internet systems, everything works due to these satellites that we launch and launch and launch into the atmosphere. So, it's a very practical need. One more. And then, nowadays, most developed countries have already uh, organized aerospace forces for national security. Without space, it's impossible to protect our countries, to protect ourselves as nations. And here you can see military satellites for Earth service observations, that is fine, or space flight control systems. And this is where Vimir is important. Without our engineers, without our graduates, such systems would never exist. And without this, our aerospace forces would never exist. Yeah. Uh, why do we need all that? Well, the history goes back to the middle of the 20th century, when the Soviet Union and the United States started a 
and space race. This space race uh, was very dynamic, very important in tales. And uh, firstly, the United States of America believed that they had no competitors, whatever. They were absolutely sure that they will be the first to launch the first artificial satellite, they will be the first in the open space. And when, on the 4th of October 1957, our uh, Sputnik went, was launched, that was a shock. The Americans couldn't believe it was true. Absolutely. Yeah. They were frustrated. They blamed different departments for having uh, lost this information before. They said that their intelligence servants didn't work properly. They didn't provide them with any information. What was going on at the United States, the USSR? Well, uh, the United States believed that the USSR was in ruin. The country was absolutely devastated after the Second World War. They had no science, no technology, no education. So that was a true shock. And uh, since that date, this race started. And as you can see further, this race uh, was really very tense. Two countries were going head to head. Well, uh, our Sputnik was launched on the 4th of October 57. In December 57, Americans started a launch which collapsed. They were again very frustrated and they even called this uh, unsuccessful launch Flopnik. What is the flop? Flop. Uh, stay put me. Not move with me, but stay with them, or Kapuchnik. That was published in American newspapers. Uh, their successful launch was then on the 1st of February 58, which is uh, uh, four months later. Yeah. Well, four months is not a, 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 a long term, but for the United States, it was long term because the race was on. They wanted to win. And here you can see how tense these races were. So our human spaceflight missions, and the, uh, you can see different dates, and you can see that on um, the right, in the right column, everything is first. Our first man in space, first full day in space, first crew in space, etc, etc, etc. Everybody wanted to be first in something. And, uh, yeah, uh, the same about the USA. And they were trying to catch up all the time. They wanted to become again the leading nation uh, in uh, this space race. Yes? Yeah? And finally comes the date that we are celebrating these days, April the 12th, 1961. Uh, Yuri Gagarin was on board, everybody knows that. And what he did, Vasak the first, orbited the Earth, which means circled around the whole planet. Uh, he launched on the territory of our country and uh, that I landed on the territory of our country. And uh, his flight lasted for 108 minutes. Uh, Alan Shepard was the first American astronaut yeah? uh, who did something similar on the 5th of May 61, three weeks later. I said something similar because it was not an orbital circuit, but it was a suborbital, which means a ballistic trajectory. He started uh, uh, from Canaveral, yes, and he, like a missile, he traveled a trajectory of a missile and landed on the trajectory on the territory of the United States. It was not an orbital. 
So he was the first one, but he was not equal to what uh, the government did. So that was definitely unprecedented in the history of space exploration. Now, after the guy did his flight, yes, he became he became yes, uh, the first world space. Uh, well, his popularity and what he did are uh, excited uh, all people living on Earth because he was the first to realize those dreams that we have mentioned. Dreams of going into outer space, of feeling yourself not an earthly person, but a spaceman. And he was a spaceman. And uh, all countries invited him. Many countries invited him uh, to our, their countries and he started on a mission which is called Peace Mission. Missia Mira. Yeah? It lasted uh, two years and he visited 30 countries. 30. Yes. Uh, you can see how many people greeted him in Czechoslovakia, uh, in Cuba, yes. uh, in Japan and India. And of course, in Great Britain. I'm saying, of course, because this visit was one of the most important and publicized. Uh, he stayed here for five days. But um, uh, firstly, it was not the government, it was not the British government that invited him. Uh, it was the Foundry Association, Workers' Foundry Association. Foundry Association is Ассоциация работников литейной промышленности, то есть металлургов. Why did they invite Gagarin? Because Gagarin, when he was a young boy, he studied at a country technical school. And so people of this trade, of this profession, they were so excited that someone like them became a cosmonaut. They invited him to visit uh, their country. And along with them, uh, the Queen and the government also decided to greet uh, Gagarin and uh, Gagarin was invited uh, to the formal official uh, dinner. dinner. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, were, there were many legends about this visit uh, that he made to Elizabeth II. And uh, uh, one of these uh, legends I'm not going to tell you about, uh, that was um, in, uh, in the palace, and we know that the love in the Buckingham Palace is uh, regulated by different protocols. The Queen is allowed to do this, but she's not allowed to do that, she must do that, she can speak to that person, but she cannot speak to that person. Uh, so everything is uh, regulated. And of course, uh, the was a man from a very humble family. He never knew anything about royal families. He didn't know how to behave with queens and princes. So when he was uh, 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 he was uh, invited uh, to the table, uh, he saw a lot of cutlery and a lot of plates in front of him. What is cutlery? Spoons, forks, knives. Uh, a certain spoon for a spoon for uh, soup, a spoon for dessert, a spoon for tea, and other other different uh, objects. He didn't know which to choose, and then he said simply, uh, "The village I'm from uh, uses only one spoon for everything. I will do the same." And he did it with only one spoon. Do you know what? Uh, the queen there, uh, she said, I was born in the Buckingham Palace, but I still don't know what our world is objects for. So I will also use only one spoon. So uh, whether it was true or whether it is only a myth, nobody can say, but uh, different stories are told about this thing. But definitely, uh, uh, Elizabeth II was uh, under great impression uh, after she left the family. Well, just a month ago, you can see that was on the 14th of March. She had the 
participated via Zoom conference uh, in one uh, scientific conference. She greeted young scientists via this video platform. And one of the scientists asked her uh, to share her memories about a guy because this young scientist also uh, was under the influence of this uh, great madam. And uh, uh, she asked uh, Elizabeth II, uh, what did Gagarin look like? What sort of man was he? And uh, Elizabeth said he was a crush. That is a lot. And then she added that she really uh, respects Gagarin for his courage. He, was, he knew when he uh, was involved in the mission, uh, he knew that it was really risky. Nobody could guarantee his safe landing. That was the first flight in the history. But he was so courageous that he did it, even not knowing whether he would return back or not. And that is what Elizabeth II talked about today. That was really great. Now, well, as for the America, well, people there, as I have already told you, they were frustrated, and the same happened after Amada Barron's flight. Well, Alan Shepard, I told you that he was the second to fly, but not uh, the orbital fly. Uh, he was informed about Gagarin's flight in the middle of the night. At 4 o'clock in the morning, somebody phoned him and told him the news. He couldn't believe it. He said, it, could, it couldn't be. It couldn't be, he said. And then he uh, asked, well, it could have been me there three weeks ago, because there had been some plans, American plans, to launch this their satellite a little bit earlier, but due to some break, this uh, the launch was delayed, and the Americans lost. Okay. Well, that is the meeting of uh, uh, John Kennedy meets. Uh, yes, and here we find uh, come to Wayne there. So, Gagarin is a great personality in our history. Uh, but what is hidden below? All the technical innovations, all these designs and constructions that only engineers could do. And they did it. They did it showing that our industry, our science, our people can do impossible things. Well, and while near is the, uh, yes, we can move on, yes, uh, and the next one, please, well, uh, you want to show our new cosmonaut candidate, yes, Roscosmos announced that uh, he uh, was accepted uh, to the team of our cosmonauts in January 2021, just three months ago. Yes, so that is how to give him, and he is our graduate, yes. Uh, well, this year our university takes part in a very important military technical forum. It's an international forum, and uh, our university will present rocket and space complexes, aerospace technology, space exploration for benefits of armed forces of our country. So, as you can see, our university is uh, um, on the front of uh, uh, military science, yeah. And uh, here, the one final uh, slide, I want to tell you that over 85% of our graduates find their jobs with different defense technological companies and uh, operations for civil uh, technical uh, engineering enterprises. So our graduates don't have any problems with finding a job. Okay, any questions? Yes? Um, uh, uh, I'm not a good Do you have uh, uh, our foreign languages? What? Foreign? Foreign languages. Yes, we do. I'm from the Department of Theoretical and Applied Linguistics, and 
we teach students uh, uh, linguistics and we prepare translators. Translators. So we uh, provide them with the profession of a special translator, uh, which is very uh, important nowadays because it's not a uh, translation of fiction. Yes? What is fiction? Это не перевод художественной литературы, да? В этом translation of uh, special texts. Uh, quite often and most often, these are different uh, technical articles, technical instructions and so on, which is very well paid. People get good money for translating such texts. And uh, as far as I know, <coughs> uh, in our city, uh, practically, uh, no other department prepares in this direction. Yeah. Okay, more questions? So, how uh -huh. we should just uh, people mm -hmm. learn? Well, uh, the first language is English, and then the second are the French or German. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what else? Yes. Can anybody answer my question? Why do we need foreign languages in this university? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one? <laughs> well, for different purposes. One of the purposes was translating different technical texts, which is very important for uh, engineers, right? Then I mentioned that uh, uh, American uh, government was really frustrated because they said our intelligence service hadn't provided us with the necessary information. Well, the same with us, yes? We also spy on them, we want to get some information about their technologies, yeah? Commercial secrets are commercial secrets and everybody wants to know. Yes, well actually one of my students is uh, going to serve in the army in such a sport where he will translate uh, secret information that is transported from overseas. <laughs> okay. If you don't have any questions, thank you and join us.